Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 4, The Early Bronze Age. In this episode, we are going to discuss the next significant period in Greece's developmental history, the Early Bronze Age, which is roughly the 3rd millennium BC, with a focus mainly on the Cyclades and the Greek mainland. With the coming of the Bronze Age, we start to get more and more material evidence, and social and economic changes begin to proceed more rapidly. The main reason was an increase in the use of metals, and the development of metallurgy. The transition from Neolithic to Bronze Age was not immediate, however. For this reason, just like the Mesolithic period is a transition between the Paleolithic and Neolithic periods, some scholars have labeled the transitional period from Neolithic to Bronze Age as Chalcolithic, from the Greek words halchos, which is copper, and lithos, stone because copper was being used in addition to stone. Since copper is a metal, it's still technically part of the early Bronze Age. Anyway, the crucial next step of adding tin to the copper to produce bronze, a much harder metal, was taken in the Near East during the 4th millennium BC. The technology came to Greece around 3000 BC, and by about 2500 BC, the use of bronze as well as other metals such as lead, silver, and gold became widespread throughout Crete and the Cyclades Islands in the southern Aegean Sea. The introduction of metallurgy was a major technological advancement. Devising innovative ways to alloy metals at high temperatures, Aegean smiths created new luxury goods and better tools for agriculture, construction, and warfare. Weapons of bronze were considerably more lethal than those made of stone, bone, or copper. Bronze was much stronger, and was able to hold a razor edge, making feasible the production of durable metal daggers, swords, and spearheads. The dagger soon became standard equipment for warriors in the Bronze Age, and it eventually was lengthened into swords, increasing the killing efficiency of these new weapons. Bronze Age smiths also made daggers and swords with lavish decorations added to them, as objects for display and ostentation, highly visible symbols of wealth and status. This creation of a new kind of wealth and status represented a turning point in Greek social and economic relations. It was the high-ranking individuals and families, those with greater surpluses of wealth, who had the most access to bronze and scarce metal products. Possession of these and other prestige items set them further apart from the mass population. The desire to accumulate wealth in the form of various metal objects, such as jewelry, and to possess those objects as status symbols, stimulated demand for metals and for the skilled workers who could fashion them. This gave rise to local specialists and workshops and accelerated trade for copper and tin and other metals, not only with the Near East, but also with the peoples of Central and Western Europe, where tin was abundant. Some of these specialists were itinerant Near Easterners who had traveled west looking for new markets for their skills. They brought with them not only their technological expertise, but also a repertoire of myths that influenced the people with whom they interacted. In this way, they became indirect agents of cultural change. Early Bronze Age Greece was edging its way into the wider economy and culture of the Mediterranean world, and as the economy expanded and the settlements grew larger, so did the wealth, power, and authority of their leaders, now established as hereditary chiefs, who were accorded exceptional honors and privileges. Mediterranean polyculture, or the cultivation of olives and grapes, as well as grain, in one agricultural system, also fully evolved in the 3rd millennium BC, as people began to exploit new plants to expand their diet. The emergence of this system, which still dominates Mediterranean agriculture today, had two important consequences. An increase in food supply, which stimulated population growth, and further diversification and specialization of agriculture. This in turn produced valuable new products, such as olive oil and wine, both of which required new storage techniques for local use and for trade. The manufacture of great storage jars therefore gained popularity, adding another specialization to the crafts of the period. Specialization in the production of food and goods also meant that the specialists in these fields had no time to grow their own food or fashion the variety of things that they needed for everyday life. They had to acquire their food and other goods through exchange. Society therefore became increasingly interdependent both economically and socially. Throughout the Bronze Age, no events in Greece, Crete, or the Aegean can be firmly dated by contemporary sources. Unlike the civilizations of Egypt and the Near East, the peoples of these areas were illiterate through the 3rd millennium BC, and when they finally developed a script, 
They did not record historical events. We therefore once again have to rely for chronology almost entirely on the dating of material objects. Of these, pottery is by far the most widespread, and was used at all levels of society, for cooking, eating, drinking, and storing, and in all grades of quality. Even when pots are broken, the pieces survive and fire does not destroy them. As in modern times, different generations tend to have different tastes. Therefore, changes in the style of decoration and popular shapes can be classified. And with the help of stratified deposits, which show which pots are contemporaneous, they can be arranged in sequence and we can establish a relative chronology. The Bronze Age is divided into three periods. Early, roughly 3000 to 2000 BC. Middle, roughly 2000 to 1550 BC and late, roughly 1550 BC to 1100 BC. They are differentiated between Minoan, which is Crete, Helladic, the mainland, and Cyclotic, the Cyclades, although the general chronologies are all about the same. These three each then are divided into 1, 2, and 3, and subdivided further into A, B, and C. So for instance, you can have early Cyclotic 1A, middle Minoan 2B, late Helladic 3C, and so forth. I'll post a chart on the website for you to peruse. It's not as complicated as it sounds. The differences in a period's A, B, and C are minuscule and are more for archaeological folks, and aren't necessarily pertinent for understanding the historical narrative. Another means at arriving at dates for organic objects is radiocarbon dating. Since we know the amount of carbon-14 in any organic object, and since the carbon-14 decays at a fixed rate, it is possible to measure the amount of carbon-14 left in an object. The older something is, the less carbon-14 will be in it. So this is useful for relative dating. However, this method can provide inaccuracies of up to two or three hundred years, but for an era before coins, inscriptions, or written records, this is absolutely crucial. The more advanced cultures during the early Bronze Age were found on Crete. There will be more about them next episode, and in the Cyclades, the group of islands in the southern Aegean. Their name is derived from the word kuklos, meaning circle, since they form a sort of circle around Delos. They are a stepping stone and key link between Asia Minor, Crete, and Greece. It was certainly through them that Near Eastern influences reached Greece and allowed them to achieve a period of great prosperity. During the 3rd millennium BC, the Cyclades are most famous for their marble sculpture, and the islands of Naxos and Paros in particular. Shown in an abstract, geometric form, these sculptures had features that include triangular-shaped noses, an oval face, sloping shoulders, breasts, and an abdomen, known as the canonical style. Most figures were of nude women, with their arms folded across their chest. Her feet are tilted backwards, possibly meaning that these figures were intended to be laid down. This style accounts for the overwhelming majority of figures. However, the seated male lyre player is one of the exceptions. As its title portrays, it shows a seated male figure, holding a lyre, and actively engaged in making music. It is about 9 inches tall, which is really small compared to the majority of cyclotic artifacts found. Some of them are even life-sized, but most averaged about 18 inches high. The function of these canonical figurines is unknown. In the absence of a written record, we must use interpretation. But the archaeological data is insufficient due to extensive looting of the Cyclotic Islands in the 1950s and 60s, as they were in great demand on the international art market. It has been estimated that out of approximately 1,400 figurines, only 40% have been recovered through systematic excavations with proper documentation. Regardless, we do know that most came from graves, leading many to theorize their involvement in funerary rituals, possibly being representations of the deceased servants or concubines in the afterlife, or votive figurines. Some have also appeared in domestic contexts. To me, it seems more likely that the female figurines are just a newer version of the Neolithic mother goddess fertility figure, as the plumpness gives way to a more rigid form. Instead of clay, they are being made with a new medium, marble. But these weren't meant to be carried about and handled like their predecessors. Instead, these were probably meant to be marveled at and worshipped. Although the mainland was not creating representational art quite like the Cyclades, that doesn't mean that in other aspects they weren't developing. Once the use of bronze fully goes into effect, we see a period of impressive growth from 2500 to 2200 BC, 
there's significant increase in population, and more trade is taking place between the Greek mainland, Crete, and the Aegean islands, as well as even more within each area. The pottery shows influence from western Anatolia, and a fast-spinning version of the potter's wheel is introduced from the Near East, leading to new shapes being able to be made, such as pouring vessels. An apprentice controlled the wheel while the potter was free to use both hands to mold the clay to his desired shape. The development of metallurgy, together with the growth of trade, increased specialization and created more complex societies. It is in this period that we first see the emergence of stone fortifications and large buildings, suggesting a stronger authority and increased resources, accompanied by a growing danger from neighbors or pirates. For these new features, the main evidence comes from coastal sites like Boeotia, Attica, and the Argolid, or islands like Aegina, Euboea, and the Cyclades. There are good examples of both fortifications and a large building at Lerna in the Argolid. At Lerna, the House of Tiles, so named because it had a roof of baked tiles covering more than one story of rooms, may have been the house of the ruling chief. If so, then this may be the beginning of an important architectural tradition, as we will see in upcoming episodes, with the palaces on Crete and late Bronze Age Greece. The sophistication of the architecture and the quality of the artifacts at this time show a fairly complex political and economic system, though far less advanced than those of the Near East and Egypt. Lerna flourished from around 3000 to 2100 BC, but then it was suddenly destroyed, along with a number of other towns and villages in the Argolid, Attica, and Laconia. Similar devastation of settlements occurred throughout much of Europe at this time. The island sites do not show any signs of destruction, however. From 2100 to 1600 BC, Mainland Greece appears to enter a period of cultural stagnation, in which the archaeological record is both meager and unspectacular, which has led to the theory that this destruction marks the arrival of a new people with different customs and, as we will see down the road, a new language. Yes, the Proto-Greeks have arrived on the scene. The theory continues that these Proto-Greek people arrived in Mainland Greece as part of a huge wave of migrating peoples from the north and east. This theory is the result of modern linguistic analysis. In the 18th century AD, scholars began to recognize that ancient Greek bore many similarities to other dead languages, such as Latin, Old Persian, and Sanskrit, as well as to entire families of spoken languages, such as Romance, Germanic, and Slavic. They observed, for example, a striking similarity in various words. We will use night as an example, but there are many, many options that I could have chosen. Also, I probably am going to butcher some of these words, so don't hold it against me. Anyway, night in Greek is nux, noctos in the genitive case. Latin is nox, noctis in the genitive case. Sanskrit is noct, English is night, Spanish is noque, French is nuit, German is noct, Russian is nok, and so on. That English speakers have two completely dissimilar pronouns to refer to themselves in different grammatical contexts, the words I and me, is a feature common in numerous other languages. The close likeliness is in vocabulary and grammatical structure among ancient languages and their descendants soon led to the hypothesis that they had all sprung from a common linguistic ancestor, which was termed Indo-European. It was reasoned that there had once been a single Indo-European homeland, located perhaps in the vast steppes north of the Black and Caspian Seas, in Central Asia, and that the separate languages developed over the course of migrations from the homeland into distant places around 4500 to 2000 BC. The original language would have disappeared well before the invention of writing, however. The speakers of Proto-Greek were thus a part of a great and lengthy ancient exodus of peoples, which gradually over the centuries spread the Indo-European languages across Europe and Asia from Ireland to China. So with that in mind, the standard belief goes as follows. Greek-speaking peoples came down into the Peloponnese in three waves, with the earliest being sometime between 2100 and 1900 BC, a second wave occurring around 1600 BC, and a third wave would arrive at the end of the Bronze Age. When they arrived, they came with horses, a previously unknown site in Greece. They began to intermingle with the pre-Greek peoples, called the Pelasgians by later Greek sources. They spoke an early form of Greek, yet they absorbed into their language a number of words used by the locals. 
These were particularly place names ending in Endos, Sos, and Tos, such as Corinthos, which is Corinth, and the mountains of Hymettus and Parnassus. There are also names of indigenous animals and plants, such as Hyacinthos, the hyacinth, and Narcissus, Narcissus. In the Greek words for the sea, Thalassa, and an island, Nisos, fall into the same category. The common link between such words is that they stood for things probably unfamiliar to the new arrivals, so they just borrowed the names. After all, these people from Central Asia wouldn't be familiar with the sea and islands. The most we can safely say about these incoming Greek speakers is that they practiced herding and agriculture, and they knew metallurgy and other crafts, such as pottery and cloth making. Of their society, we can surmise only that they were organizing clans that were patriarchal and patrilineal, meaning they were ruled by men and descent passed down through the male. Their primary divinity was Zeus, a powerful male god, and they were a warlike people with a hierarchical leadership system. In most respects, except for language and religion, the two peoples were probably very similar. The process of displacement was probably a long one, with both Greek and indigenous languages existing side by side for centuries, during which the native people and the newcomers gradually merged into a single people through generations of intermarriage and their two cultures fused into a single culture that contained elements of both. Population increased, new settlements arose, there were advances in metallurgy, and contacts with the civilizations of Crete and the Near East began, all of which would lead to the ushering in of the high civilization of the late Bronze Age. The idea that advanced civilizations had existed in the Aegean during the late Bronze Age was not known until the unearthing in the late 19th century AD of three famous cities from the mythical Age of Heroes. But in 1870, Heinrich Schliemann, who was a wealthy German businessman turned archaeologist, discovered the city of Troy. In Schliemann's day, most historians dismissed the stories of Homer as just another mythical tale. Schliemann, however, believed what he read in Homer and went looking for Troy. He found a massive mound at a place called Hisarlik in northwestern Turkey. But this site was sitting miles away from the coastline, but it did not mesh with Homer's account of Troy sitting on the sea. But Schliemann found that where there was now land, there used to be a great harbor, as his archaeological team revealed the massive ruins of a Bronze Age city, which he identified as the mythical Troy. The news electrified the scholarly world and captured the public's imagination, since there really had been a Troy, where Homer said it was located. Schliemann then decided to look for Mycenae in 1876. He also was well-versed in Pausanias, a 2nd century AD geographer who traveled around Greece and wrote about what he saw. Pausanias is fairly accurate in his descriptions. So Schliemann went to the northeastern Peloponnese and found Mycenae. Although it was a small, rather insignificant town throughout recorded Greek history, the Bronze Age ruins show a heavily fortified citadel with enormous walls, a city worthy of the legends. After which, Schliemann labeled these Bronze Age Greeks the Mycenaeans, after their chief city. Because according to Homer, Agamemnon, whose palace was at Mycenae, was the overall military leader of the Greek troops during the Trojan War. No less spectacular was the discovery by an English archaeologist named Sir Arthur Evans in 1900. Evans went to Athens and saw many inscriptions that had been found from a mound near the modern town of Heraklion on the northern shore of Crete. This led him to dig the site where the looting had been active, and he discovered the Bronze Age palace complex of Knossos. He brought to light an entire civilization, which was previously unknown to us, apart from mythology and other vague references in the ancient authors. He called them the Minoans, after their mythical king Minos, who, according to Homer, lived three generations before the Trojan War. These Minoans exercised a powerful cultural influence on the Greek mainland from 2100 to 1600 BC, during their period of infancy, as well as the Cyclotic Islands. So in the next episode... We will turn to Crete and examine the development of a culture that had such profound impact on the Greeks. So tune in next time to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 5, Minoan Crete. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. 
a new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, Hymn to Ares, from his new album, The Ancient Greek Cathar of Classical Antiquity. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.